Good morning, everyone. We are here with Lauren Stewart. She is with Mommy Bay State Park, uh, a naturalist through ODNR. She will be talking about what smells today or uh, more specifically about skunks in Ohio. Thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us and for providing this program for us. Absolutely. So as Liz mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about skunks, but I'm talking about the smelly signs of spring. So a lot of people, when they think of spring, they think of, oh, the flowers are here, the birds have come back, but there's actually a few more indicators that spring is on its way and it doesn't necessarily uh, smell the best, but it is a, the harbinger of spring, actually the skunks are. So we like to see skunks, even though they might be a little bit uh, noxious in smell, but they let us know that spring is coming. So we're first just gonna get into why do things smell in nature? And a few might be for defense, like especially in this case of the skunks, uh, smell can be an actual, an excellent defense. Um, a lot of people don't realize that snakes and a lot of reptiles also use it as defense as well. They do something called musking and it basically is secreting a really smelly oil, very similar to the skunks kind of, the kind of texture thickness of it. And they also defecate at the same time and it's a really great defense because it basically, if you poop all over yourself and you smell really bad, the potential predator is probably not gonna wanna eat you. So a smell <laughs> actually plays a really important role in defense, believe it or not. Um, territory, a lot of mammals use it to mark territory. So it can really be important, especially it's usually the males have a much larger territory and they defend them. So they actually mark off where their territory is and so for rival male, all of a sudden they start to smell rival male, they know they need to defend it on that side. And for a lot of animals, especially mammals, it is attracting mates as well. So they have pheromones that both the males and females emit and can smell. And so it can attract mates. And um, those are the three main uses of smell besides determining food, things like that, hunting. So there's a lot of different mechanisms that, uh, that uh, nature has provided to help survive, to help reproduce. And we're specifically gonna focus on the skunk, but I do have some other species that I'm going to introduce as well. So the striped skunk, this is gonna be um, an animal, the striped skunk is gonna be found in Ohio. They're actually very common in Ohio. They're um, really common, especially in the Eastern section, basically east of the Rockies, you'll find the striped skunk. Um, you're going to find them more in rural, rural areas than you are going to find them in urban areas, but that does not, not mean that they're not in the city. Um, they are incredibly adaptable, but they do need more green space than other city animals because the things that they're hunting are going to be more like insects, and if you don't have a lot of green space, you're not going to have a lot of insects for them to eat. In particular, they actually love to eat grubs. So grubs, I know, can, especially if you have a lawn, can be an issue. Um, skunks will go ahead and feed on those grubs. They really, really like them. Um, they're really good insectivores. However, they are also omnivores. They'll pretty much, um, they're kind of like garbage disposals. They'll eat a lot of stuff. Um, they can get trapped in garbage cans, which can be an issue, especially if you are not assuming a skunk is in your garbage can and you're going to throw away your trash. And then all of a sudden you are more smelly than the trash was that you were trying to throw away. That can happen. But um, for the most part, they're really important, a role in the ecosystem because they eat a variety of things and they eat things that are smaller. So they range from eating insects, which is one of their favorite foods, to small mammals. They'll actually eat mice. Um, they'll eat fish. They'll eat like crayfish. Uh, they'll, like, they'll eat fruits, grasses. They, they pretty much eat a variety of things. And they'll even go so far as to eat carrion or dead things. So they're really important. They're kind of like they're kind of like the garbage disposals. They'll pick up the stuff that a lot of animals won't eat. So where are skunks found? Pretty much everywhere. Um, you're not gonna find them up super duper far north. It's just too cold. And the closer you get to the equator, you're not gonna really find them there just because there's different species. They're not gonna find the striped skunk there. But um, the biggest place that they do lack is essentially the Rockies. They cannot survive up in that elevation and it's just not hospitable for them. It's a, that region basically has extremophiles. So you're gonna have a lot of species that are highly adapted to the alpine conditions, which the skunks are not. But if you notice, they are actually found pretty far up into Canada. So they are pretty hardy little members of the weasel family. 
but they, cause they, it's because of what they eat, which is pretty much everything. So it allows them to be distributed for most of North America. So the skunk defense. So that, when you think of a skunk, the first thing you think of is smell. Um, and skunks in particular, it's a lot of energy to produce that spray. And so they're not going to spray you if, it, if they don't have to. Uh, their first mode of defense is actually their coloration. So they have what's called reverse counter shading. So when you think of an animal like say a shark, the shark is gonna be that dark kind of gray on top with a white underbelly. So, and the reason why they have that counter shading, so if say the shark is swimming at the top of the ocean surface, and another bigger shark is looking from underneath. He's going to see that white underbelly, which is going to blend in better with the sky. So it actually acts as a way of camouflage. And then the reverse, say you you're looking down into the ocean and that shark is still at the top of the ocean layer, but we're looking down and it's going to be the darker gray, which blends in more with the darker colored ocean. So that's called counter shading. Skunks have the opposite. So counter shading is supposed to act as camouflage. The reverse counter shading is basically supposed to act as a warning. It's supposed to be easily seen. So rather than having that dark top, light belly, they have the light on the top too and dark belly. And those stripes are basically a warning. Hey, you can see me and there's a reason you can see me because you don't want to mess with me. So that, that is their first mode of defense. And then they do they have a whole series of how they warn you before they spray. And what they do is I like to, they throw a tantrum first. So they'll raise their tail. They wanna make themselves look really big. So they'll raise their tail up and they'll shake it. It's big and fluffy. It's a really good like visual saying, hey, you can see me. I know you can see me, leave me alone. And if that doesn't work, they actually stomp their feet. And it looks like it's like a two-year-old throwing a tantrum. It's actually very comical, but you don't wanna be that close to see a skunk throwing a tantrum because it means bad things are incoming. And if that doesn't work, they're gonna to try to make themselves look as big as possible. So if you look on this right hand side, you see that picture of the skunk, that skunk's actually doing a handstand. So they'll actually stand on their front two feet and lift their backside up with their tail and try to make themselves look as big and as intimidating as possible as a final warning before they basically turn around and you get the business end of the skunk, which as you can see in the bottom side of that picture is the fox who wouldn't leave the skunk alone is getting a face full of spray. Now, the spray actually comes from their anal glands. Um, dogs have them too, and a lot of mammals do so have them as well as part of the territory marking, but skunks are essentially modified to use as a, basically a weapon. And they are, um, they're in the weasel family and weasels are actually really smelly animals. They have a larger glands than a lot of the other mammals and they use that usually for territory marking, but skunks has evolved to become a defense mechanism. And so essentially these glands produce um, a chemical called thiols that has a lot of sulfur in it. So if you've ever smelled like sulfur itself, it smells like rotting eggs. Uh, sulfur is pretty noxious and pretty potent. And so they basically use that, um, that, that compound, that chemical to be able to help make themselves super defenders. And that spray is really interesting because they can control it. So they can control how it goes, whether it's like a water gun style or whether it's a misting style. So if the potential predator is close enough to them, as in within 15 feet, they can actually direct that spray like a water gun and they aim for the eyes. Um, a side effect of that spray is it can cause temporary blindness. So it's kind of um, insult upon injury that not only do you smell really bad, you also can't see for a while. Um, so it's, it's, they're pretty neat that way, but say, okay, their potential predator is a little bit farther than 15 feet. The skunk, it does not want anything to do. It stays like a bear. Skunk wants it to leave it alone and go away. The skunk will actually do a misting spray. So it's like almost like a spray bottle and you're misting your plants. It's a misting spray. And what they use is basically they use the wind to blow it into that potential predator's face. So not only, even though you think you're far enough away, you are still going to be smelly. And this spray is so potent, we can smell it up to 300, not 300, three and a half miles downwind. So we're pretty in tune to that smell. So you definitely don't want a face full of it up close if you can smell it three and a half miles away. And uh, unfortunately, it's a very common thing, especially in Route 2, 
as you're driving east across the lake, there's it's a really prime skunk habitat. And um, they unfortunately crossing route two is really hard for a lot of mammals. And route two, uh, late February smells really bad because skunks either have been scared or have been hit by cars and it's potent and it will smell bad for a while, even in the winter time. So skunk reproduction. Why I say skunks are the hair bringer of spring is because they start to mate in late February. So they have a really early um, mating schedule, a reproductive schedule if, compared to other mammals. A lot of the other mammals are waiting until like April. These guys start as early as late, early February, but typically more in late February. So, and they'll breed continuing through March. In Northwest Ohio, we get the later side just because it is just a little more frigid here with Lake Erie, but um, they can start as early as like usually Valentine's Day is actually when the skunks tend to come out that weekend, that mid-February. So um, the females are only heat for short, a short period of time. So they basically only have a really short reproductive window and um, they aren't um, monogamous by any means, but they don't have that many babies. They only have two to 10 young and their young are helpless like most mammals are. They're actually, they don't really have um, the coloration quite yet. They're actually like, they almost like little, like little, little piglets but by the second week, they already have their fur, they already have their stripes. And by the sixth week, just kind of like puppies are, they're already, their eyes, their eyes are open, they're out ready to help mom hunt or mom help them hunt in that case. And they actually stay with together until basically the next round of kids. So they stay with their mom for about a whole year. So she has a little, she has like 10 little cute little kids with her for a whole year. Um, and we, it is a very common sight to see them at Mommy Bay. Um, in usually we start to see them in April as a whole like family group coming out. So skunks tend to be nocturnal. So they are most going to be most active in the nighttime hours. And a lot of people worry about seeing skunks in the daytime hours because they think it might be a sign of rabies. But you just have to know what period of the season it is. So if you're seeing them out, say March, more of late March, April, May, or June when they have the babies, it makes a lot more sense. Because if you think of human babies, little babies, well, humans are diurnal. We're going to be up in the daylight hours. But little, little ones, infants especially, they're up all the time. Doesn't matter if it's 3 p.m. or 3 a.m., they're up and mom's got to feed. So when they're in the younger stage, it's a female with the younger kids, She's got to look for food, even though it would be her normal sleeping hour. So seeing a skunk during the day, during breeding season and kit raising season is not a cause for concern unless the skunk is acting strange. So that's just something to consider, especially with skunks, if you're seeing them during the day, but it's during the breeding season or during later on past the breeding season and the kit raising season, it's okay. But um, a big thing people don't realize is skunks can vary in color. So, um, Sometimes the striped skunk can be stripeless. If you see on that far hand, far left hand side, um, the nice thing about skunks is they don't really have any natural predators. They have one in particular, but they don't have many natural predators to worry about because that spray is an incredibly efficient defense mechanism. Uh, it can ward off a bear. So you, you, if you can beat a bear out and you're only about the size of a house cat, uh, it's a pretty good defense mechanism. So they can be something called melanistic, which means they produce more melanin than normal. And melanin gives the dark colorations, usually what we see is black. So the skunk on the left-hand side is stripeless because he's a melanistic skunk and he doesn't have a stripe because he produces more melanin than normal. Um, we, I have actually seen quite a few stri uh, stripeless striped skunks um, in this, the Northwest region. And that's just because they, nothing's really going to try to eat him because he's going to spray him before it can get to him. They can also be albino, like the one in the middle. And for most cases, albinism for an animal that is as small as a skunk is almost a certain death sentence because usually an animal that's mid-sized, small to mid-sized has a lot of predators. Not so much in the case of the skunk, just because the skunk uh, is just a very efficient at defending themselves. And then it can have amelanism. So it doesn't produce enough melanism. So basically the skunk looks like he's draped in white. So his, his, 
stripe has merged together and almost looks like it has a cape on. And as I was saying, like the albin, albin, um, albino skunk, usually that is not a good mutation to have just because it doesn't aid in camouflage and it makes it too easy to see. But skunks are already want to be seen. So you may be wondering, well, okay, so skunks can ward off a bear. What is their predator? So their true, only true natural predator it, that will actually like seek out and eat skunks on purpose is an animal that is nocturnal, just like the skunks are, and has a terrible sense of smell. And the only animal that really likes to eat skunks is the great horned owl. They are out at the same time as skunks, they're big enough to catch them, and they basically cannot smell. So no perfect animal to eat a skunk than somebody whose nose doesn't really work. They also have silent flight. They have basically fuzzy edges to their feathers that basically break up that ear pocket so it doesn't make that flapping sound. So they can sneak up on the skunk and grab them before they can even spray. Because the only thing they really have to worry about is being blinded by the skunk spray. So as Liz was mentioning earlier, skunks as pet, I'm thinking, that's weird. Who in their right mind would have a skunk as a pet? But skunks are in the weasel family. So there is actually a very common animal sold as a pet that is in the weasel family as well. And that is the ferret. So skunks actually behave very similarly to ferrets. They're very inquisitive. Um, they're also very intelligent. So they're an interesting animal to have. They are also legal to own in Ohio. You do have to have a permit after you buy your skunk and DNR is going to come and make sure it was an actual captive born skunk and you have the right stuff to have it. And, um, but there are breeders specifically that breed skunks um, or you can sometimes get them in some exotic pet stores, but you can actually illegally own a skunk in Ohio. So they do have um, a surgery that a lot of them do. It's called demusking. They do this for ferrets as well, but basically it removes those oversized glands that allow them to spray. Um, the only downside with this is they aren't domesticated like cats or dogs. So that means they are not going to behave the same way that cats or dogs do. They're going to be more unpredictable because they are still essentially wild animals that we are just having in our house. Um, so if they do get out, they are basically going to be let out in the wild defenseless. They've, they've had that demusking surgery. So that is just something to consider if you do want to own a skunk as a pet. Um, you never want to obtain them from the wild. Um, not only is that you shouldn't remove wild animals from their natural habitat, um, wild animals also have an assortment of parasites and diseases and animals that are bred in captivity are hopefully going to be free from them or they're actually going to have vet care and things like that. Um, and I'm going to talk about one of the diseases in particular, rabies. So skunks, uh, this is actually a map from the CDC uh, talking about the rabies and what animal in what region tends to cause the, cause the most ca documented cases of rabies. Um, found in animals. So in for a big part, especially in the mid, mid Midwest, is going to be the skunk. Um, the issue with skunks are, and if you look at all the animals that you see here, they are um, carnivorous. So they are more likely to get the disease because they are directly interacting with other animals. All mammals can carry rabies. Rabies, the rabies virus um, is spread by saliva, it's spread by blood, bodily fluids, essentially. And so if the skunk is interacting with another animal, it gets bitten by another potential prey animal, it, it itself becomes infected. And if it bites another animal and the other animal gets away, that is infected. So it's, you're more likely to find rabies in carnivorous animals themselves. So uh, wild animals in 2018, accounted for almost 93% of rabies cases in the US. Um, bats were most frequently reported rabid. Um, the issue with bats is when they are rabid, they're a lot easier to come across just because of the nature of their movement. So they fly. So if a bat is rabid and it has what's called the dumb rabies, so basically it's the more paralytic rabies rather than the furious rabies where you see like if you think of old yeller where the dog was frothing and angry, that's furious rabies. Dumb rabies is basically the animal is based catatonic or acting overly placid. So bats essentially can't, a lot of bats, if they get 
the dumb rabies, they can't fly. And so if you come across that on the ground, you, it typically tends to have an illness in some ways. And a lot of times it tends to be rabies. So we're more likely to encounter rabid bats because the sick bats cannot fly and cannot get away from us. So we tend, that's why the, the rates of rabies tend to be higher in bats just because of their mode of transportation because they fly and when they're sick, they cannot fly and we're more likely to come in contact with them because they can't get away, they can't move anywhere. <coughs> so, um, but skunks were about 20% of the 2018 cases. Um, raccoons are way up there as well. Um, a lot of people think raccoons are super cute, want to feed them. Um, feeding wild animals, never a good idea. Raccoons tend to have a higher rate of rabies than some of the, the larger to mid-sized mammals. And they also are super smart and are always around people. So it's never a good idea to feed raccoons. Raccoons also carry a parasite that can cause permanent blindness and they carry distemper, which can kill your dog. So feeding wild animals, never a good idea. Um, raccoons, skunks, and foxes in particular, don't feed them. They're supposed to be in the wild and we don't want super close interactions because they have diseases that can affect us and or our pets. So rabies and skunks, you'll typically see the animal active in the daytime. So I admit that's why I was mentioning that people get worried seeing skunks in the daytime. If it's outside of that breeding season, it can be a cause for concern. If they act um, like they're drunk, essentially they're stumbling they are kind of just acting really, really confused um, or almost like walking in circles is another big one that um, it may be rabies. That's something is if you see that definitely contact um, DNR, contact animal control, contact the city official, wherever you at, but let, let them know that it needs to be investigated. Um, distemper can also cause us as well. Um, we had it was three years ago now, we had an outbreak of canine distemper in our park in the raccoon population. Our raccoon population was so, so huge that basically one got sick and it spread like wildfire throughout that raccoon population. And we seriously had probably a one summer, it was 10 raccoons that either I called in or a guest called in because they showed symptoms essentially of rabies and it ended up being distemper. So distemper can also cause that, but distemper is essentially fatal to them as well. And it's something that needs to be investigated. If you ever think that a wild animal you come across um, is acting strangely or something that is caused to concern, call somebody. Um, rabies is almost, there's only one case of someone really truly surviving without permanent complete brain damage. It's basically almost hundred percent fatal. If, uh, if, uh, if not treated before symptoms come up. So definitely something that um, if you, if within doubt, call somebody, if you think this, the animal may be potentially rape, uh, rabid. So I mentioned we were talking about skunks, but we also have a few animals with the namesake of the skunk. So the skunk who is known for his smell um, has another, another plants and animals that are also named after it because uh, they were so similar. So smell can be used for reproduction. So skunks don't use their smell for reproduction. They use their smell for defense, but, oops, sorry. Skunk cabbage uses its smell for reproduction. So skunk cabbage does not sound like a very appealing plant that you may want in your yard, but it is actually an incredibly cool native plant to Ohio. So here's a picture of skunk cabbage. It kind of looks like a weird version of a calla lily. Um, it does not smell like a cow lily. It smells like a dead skunk, actually. And the way skunk cabbage uses its smell is so it's a mix of it's a mix of defense and reproduction. So essentially, skunk cabbage. If you tear a leaf, it smells really musky, like a skunk. It smells bad, it's sulfurous. It's it's very unpleasant. Um, however, when it blooms, its flower also smells like that. And it's a little bit mix of, um, it smells like something dead and rotting as well. So you think of this plant, it's like, oh, it must be terrible. It must be poisonous. You don't want to touch it. Um, it's not poisonous. Um, it doesn't cause any dermatitis or any skin reactions, but that smell, um, it, the smell of flower in particular 
brings flies and beetles, it, scavenging insects essentially to come to it. And those animals are tricked thinking it, they're finding a dead carcass and they're wandering around that flower looking for the potential food and by process, they're actually pollinating that flower. Um, and the leaves themselves are basically that smell because uh, they also taste bad as well. So if that, uh, the brow a large browsing herbivore is coming and biting those leaves, it actually dissuades them from continuing on feeding on that plant. Because what's really interesting about that plant, um, it grows in wetland soils. Um, a really good place to see this um, in oak opening region. Um, oak opening is Metro Park by the uh, Buner Center on the Red Trail, has a lot of skunk cabbage. Wildwood Metro Park has a ton of them. So basically any edge forest habitat that can get, especially in the low areas that gets really wet, great place to see skunk cabbage. But what's very interesting about skunk cabbage is it basically creates its own heat. And when I say it creates its own heat, it can generate temperatures 27 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the air temperature. So if the air temperature is 10 degrees, it can generate up to 73 degrees Fahrenheit. That little, it will be 73 degrees Fahrenheit, that little area where it is at. So, um, and it's really neat. It's basically from cell, it, it has a modified cellular respiration. And the reason why it generates its own heat is it's blooming in February. And most of the northern half of North America is gonna have some snow at that point. And it doesn't matter if it blooms in the snow, the most plants, if they bloom in the snow, they're gonna be covered by snow. There's gonna be no possible um, pollination and there's gonna be cellular death because they're gonna, the plant with the cells, the cells are gonna be freezing and bursting. Not the case for skunk cabbage. It basically is its own space heater and generates that heat with cellular respiration. And you can see literally like the snow is almost a foot deep and it basically creates its own heat, has its own hole and the flies can go in and out of it. Um, a lot of the insects that it uses to pollinate are one of the very first emerging insects in the winter time. And when it generates that own heat, it actually helps spread the smell quicker because it travels better in that warm air. So therefore it helps get those pollinating insects to come to it. So this plant is super duper cool. Um, it, I mean, it, thinking of a plant, like a plant that generates its own heat is something that's just crazy. And the, this, the amount of heat it can generate is just mind boggling all through just cellular respiration. So here's the flower close up. Basically the spath or spath is a modified leaf. So the same leaves that are down here, it's just a modified leaf um, that basically holds the spadix, which has the flowers. And so the spadix of the flowers is what these flies are wandering all over and pollinating in their um, very aimless search for the potential dead meat. So here's an example of a fly on this skunk cabbage. So those flies are going in and out looking for that food and coming out very disappointed. And so where can you find skunk cabbage? Pretty much up in the Northeast and a little bit of the Northern half of the Midwest. So very, very common in Ohio um, in the right area, especially Northwest Ohio, those edge woodlands and those low points. Um, they like wet soils, but they don't tolerate clay, like a whole bunch of clay as well. So we're gonna find them more in the oak opening regions. We don't really find them at Mommy Bay. The soil is just too saturated for too long, essentially for us to find them. But um, the oak opening regions in the wet low lying areas, they're very, very common. So look for swamping areas, look for low lying areas, and then wet woods. So Wildwood Metro Park, Oak Openings Metro Park, Pearson Metro Park actually has enough buried soil that we can find them there. Um, and so this is actually from Wildwood Metro Park. These big leaves that kind of look like lettuce or cabbage leaves, hence skunk cabbage. Um, this is all skunk cabbage. So um, skunk cabbage reminds me of a plant, like it looks like a prehistoric plant to me. It looks like it was something that I'd seen in Jurassic Park. It is a very old lineage of plant. So it does make sense, but they have these big, big leaves that look like an unfurled head of lettuce, uh, cabbage. So when does it bloom? 
So it's going to be blooming as early as February and all the way through April. So this is actually a thermo, like a, a temperature gun view of this plant. So you can actually see um, how warm the spadix is in the middle. And here's it in the snow. The snow is around it. And there's that little warm center, center where all that cellular respiration is happening and thus melting that snow around it. These plants are super cool, especially if you see them in the snow. It just blows my mind. This plant can produce basically up to 63 degrees of its own, not body heat, but plant heat. So other skunky animals. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the skunk uses that, that, those smells for a great defense. But the red fox also smells in very, 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 very similar to a skunk. Not quite as potent, but they are not pleasant smelling in the least. Um, so they're going to be very similar to size-wise to a dog. Um, they are fluffy, so it gives them a bigger appearance, but these foxes weigh eight to 15 pounds. I have a house cat that is larger than a typical fox, weight-wise at least. She's a very big cat, but they are going to be longer. They're going to be more lanky and spread out. Um, that nice, long, pretty muzzle. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that foxes aren't always red. So there's some genetic variations in foxes. They can be red. They can be what's called silver, which is gray. They can be black melanistic. So this very blurry picture is actually, we had a melanistic fox. So this is the backside of the fox. Um, this is his tail right here. And that actually helped me confirm that this was a fox, and not a weird raccoon. They just the bad, weird picture of it. Um, foxes are always, even the melanistic, almost always retain that white tip of their tail. And this right here is the tail, that backside, and you can see the ears he's basically facing away from the camera. So this is a melanistic, more uh, a melanistic, almost silver version of a red fox. So they are found, even their color mutations are found here in Northwest Ohio. So um, they're very, very cool animals. Uh, they are more obligate carnivores, so they're going to be eating more, have to eat more animals than they can eat, like say like berries or, or grasses. Um, they'll only really eat the non-animal things if they're desperate and really, really hungry, but they're going to be seeking out insects, small mammals, birds, bird eggs, things like that. So they're really skilled hunters. Um, there's a whole long list of what they'll eat. Um, they'll eat all the way things from like fish and frogs. Um, they're at mommy bay. A lot of times they're eating, uh, they're eating snakes, water snakes, garter snakes, or, uh, we have a huge frog population. So there's plenty of food for them, but they'll also go and eat things like earthworms, grasshoppers, things like that. Small mammals and, uh, ground nesting birds and their eggs is, can be a big issue, especially if you have an uncontrolled population of foxes. Um, they can decimate an at-risk ground nesting bird population as well. Uh, another thing that is they are very highly adapted to urban areas. Uh, we had foxes in Toledo, like in the city, city part of Toledo. Um, they'll eat dead things and they'll eat garbage. So, you know, that usually does them well to deal with um, and being co close proximity to um, humans and human settlements. So, well, why are they skunky? They have that modified musk gland at the base of their tail, and they're, they kind of smell like skunk mixed with urine. They're pretty intensely smelling um, animals, but um, they use that for marking. And um, they can be active all the time, but typically you'll find them um, dawn and dusk. And the, the word to describe that is crepuscular. So they're going to be active the, the, more of like when the sun is rising and the sun is setting. So there's diurnal for the day, nocturnal for the night, and crepuscular for the in-betweens. So um, foxes, they have a pretty big home range, five to 10 square miles, and it's all dependent on food availability and areas that where the food uh, is available, they can be a lot denser in population. You might have a lot more smaller range because they just don't need that big of territory because there's plenty of food. But um, the males, by far are going to go farther than the females. The females are staying closer to their home dens and they have to raise the pups. So they don't have as large as territories. Red foxes are found um, on both sides of the pond, both sides of the Atlantic. 
Um, they're, they're very, very common um, in the northern half of North America and also the northern half of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, they are invasive in Australia. So Australia only has um, marsupials and the red fox as a mammal is actually an invasive species and is a big issue because they eat a lot of things and they eat a lot of small things. And so that actually really affects their uh, ground nesting bird populations and a lot of their marsupials that are found on the ground. So the Eastern fox snake. Um, a fun, fun thing to learn is a lot of times if an animal has the word fox in its name, um, it's basically saying it smells like a skunk. Um, so skunk snake isn't as attractive name as fox snake. So we went with Eastern fox snake. And also the fox snakes have orange on them, so it fit a little bit better. But an Eastern fox snake actually smells a lot like skunk. And the fun part about Eastern fox snakes is they are a true native of Northwest Ohio. So um, they are uh, a species of concern in Ohio. Um, they've been threatened by habitat loss and the pet trade. And um, they are often misidentified as copperheads or even the rattlesnake, which actually really um, hurt their pop populations initially. People killed them thinking they're a venomous species of snake. We do not have copperheads in Northwest Ohio and we, Massasauga rattlesnakes, the small swamp rattlers, don't get very big. They were always uncommon. They never were super high in density around this area. And we have not seen the Massasauga in Northwest Ohio basically since the 80s. So it's been a while since we've seen the Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, we don't have copperheads here. So even still today with more information and more availability of the information to be spread, people still mistake these snakes for a potential venomous snake. Um, and the reason why they have that coppery head and they also shake their tail as a defense against either something hard or against um, dead or dry grass or leaves. And it sounds very convincingly like a rattlesnake rattle. And that's the point is they wanna pretend they're rattlesnakes saying, hey, I'm venomous, leave me alone, even though they're really not. So you may be asking, okay, so what does this have to do with the skunk? Well, um, the rat snake, the fox snake, which is the rat snake family, um, actually has a, uh, a musk that it emits when it feels threatened. Um, so the, the fox snake will eat a variety of things, mice, birds, um, amphibians if they're super hungry, but it's not well documented that they consume them, but it's, it's inferred that they will on occasion. But um, so they are found in a variety of habitats in Northwest Ohio, but they still have a lot of natural predators. Um, the great blue heron, so they're found in the swamp areas, especially around Lake Erie is where they're most common. The great blue heron's a big one. The bald eagle totally will eat these guys. Red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, Cooper's hawks are big enough to grab them. Um, when they're young, bullfrogs can eat them. Um, other snakes may eat them as well. So they're, um, they have a lot of predators. And so how they deal with that is they can be smelly. So when threatened, they basically release a smelly musk from their cloaca. So basically where they go to the bathroom and it smells, it is very, very, very similar to a skunk smell. It is potent. It will make your eyes water. And what they tend to do is they'll, they'll secrete it and they'll wriggle and writhe and rub it all over themselves. So not only do they smell bad, they've rubbed it all over themselves to make themselves taste really bad. So it's a pretty good defense mechanism. Um, a lot of times the birds will leave them alone. The mammals, like the foxes, raccoons, they want nothing to do with that. That tastes really bad. It's not worth it to get a mouthful of that musk. So that is how they got the name fox snake, which really means they smell like a skunk. So skunk snake. And that is all of the animals I have to talk to you guys about today. Do you have any questions about my skunky animals and plants? No? Well, you've heard the expression, smart as a fox? Yes. Is it true that they are pretty intelligent? Yes, yep. So they are probably gonna be equivalent of um, more of the smarter breeds of dogs. <laughs> So you're getting more like the poodle level, not quite the border collie level, but more of like the poodle level um, of, of dog intelligence, um, canine intelligence. They're, they're pretty smart and they're, they're clever and they're really good problem solvers. 
which is why they do so well around people. Um, that they can live in urban environments no problem just because they know how to avoid people and they know how to find food. I've never seen an albino skunk. Are they pretty rare? They aren't common just because albinism is a recessive gene. So you basically have to have two skunks that carry the, that, the albino gene. They both have to mate and it has to be expressed. So essentially like say big A, small A, big A, small A. And so most of the litters, when you do the, most of their litter, when you do the cross, they're going to get either a big A, which is that, that hides the albino gene. So you basically have to get those two recessive genes together for it to be expressed. And so it's not like basically, even if the both the parent skunks have that hidden recessive gene with them, at max, only 25% of the litter could be albino. Have you personally seen any? I have not seen albino skunk. I have seen an amelanistic skunk. So it has way more white than normal, but it still had, it still had melanin production. So it still had black on it in places. And I have seen almost a completely melanistic skunk. It just had an itty bitty patch of white on the top of its head. Um, albinism is a lot less common. Um, melanism is um, a more dominant gene. So if you have one parent that's darker, their litter is most likely gonna be almost all dark. I noticed that the mongoose carries rabies in the, uh, Puerto Rico. Yes, yes. And, and they uh, basically fit in the same niche as the skunks and foxes and raccoons do they, there. They look like they could be related to the skunk. Family. They are loosely related to the weasel family. They're a much older order or of mammals. So they're more on the baseline of the weasel. They split off a lot sooner. But yes, they fill that same role as the weasels there over there do. And they're also very smart, very smart little creatures, mongoose are. Also, I hate to dominate, but I got the question about rabies. Yes. I, I, when I was a boy, I had a dog that uh, my dad put, had to have it put down because it was foaming at the mouth. And we assumed it had rabies and we didn't want, you know, it, oh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it got vicious and we didn't want anybody, we wanted to bite anybody. But is that a symptom, foaming of the mouth? That you it, see is, it, it can be. So that can be the symptom of um, the, the furious rabies subset. So how it presents the, the two-way, the dumb rabies, where basically it's just acting super lethargic, not really interacting with anything. And then there's the furious rabies, which you're most likely to get, to, it's more likely to spread because it basically makes the animal hyper-aggressive. And the foaming of the mouth with extra bodily fluids are everywhere. It could have been rabies. Um, it also could have been distemper. Distemper actually looks very similar to rabies. Uh, the raccoons at Mommy Bay that had distemper essentially were stumbling around. They were looking like they were um, either had been hit on the head or were drunk. They were, they were foaming at the mouth. They were um, laying down, but they were also were aggressive. Like people didn't realize where they were and they were hearing hissing and growling when they were walking by certain areas only to be find out later that there was a raccoon right there, but it was just, it couldn't really move because it had distemper, which messes with their, mo their motor control. So it could have been distemper, but it also could have been rabies. So, and that's one of those cases where you don't want to even guess which one it is. It's just better to, to, <laughs> to either put the potential animal down or let the authorities know. And uh, yeah, both of those are almost, almost all, well, the rabies is 100% fatal for that wild animal, but distemper is pretty much the same for that wild animal. Um, we can vaccinate against both rabies and distemper in our pets and things like that. And even in the wild animals as well, they have done some cases. Um, Australia has basically eliminated rabies. They have, they're a much smaller nation than um, the US or, and, th and other areas like that. And they're able to control it because they're an island nation. And so they, they have quarantines and they do, they have a huge vaccination um, program that they do for their, their wild animals as well. But ra rabies, is, that's one of the things that I'm most afraid of is actually rabies. It's a scary, scary disease a virus that is basically, like I said, almost hundred percent fatal, um, especially once symptoms are onset. Anyone else have any questions? 
I just have a comment. My son was still here when you were talking about uh, the rabies, and he says that um, possums are immune to any of that, a lot of that stuff. They are. Is that true? So technically, they can get rabies, but it is so incredibly unlikely. Um, possums are one of my favorite animals. I love them. Yes, Their true. He loves them. <laughs> is only about 90 degrees. So they have a very low body temperature, and the rabies virus prefers animals that are 95 degrees or higher. So technically they can get rabies, but the rabies virus is either not going to, it's going to die or it's not going to do very well um, in it. Um, on a side note, possums are also immune to a pit viper venom. So they're immune to rattlesnake venom, copperhead venom, and water moccasin venom. So it's, they're super cool. They're cool animals, but yeah, they, are, he said that they didn't get a lot of the stuff other animals are, you know, yes, are susceptible yeah, to. They are, uh, they're just a weird animal that looks like a giant version of a rat that partied way too hard, but they're super cool. Um, they do actually don't live very long. They only live about two years in the wild. Um, same with skunks. I did not mention that skunks only live two to four years in the wild. Um, a lot of it has to do with, um, they can carry a lot of diseases and especially with humans around, getting hit by cars is one of their biggest issues, um, especially in the, edge of the urban and rural areas where they're kind of crossing roads. Um, roadkill is one of their high, it's actually like the highest risk of mortality for them. So um, a lot of skunk deaths are caused basically by humans. But is possums, they, they, unlikely vectors. How long does the smell stay on the road? Cause I can smell them like for weeks, it seems yeah. like. Um, it depends I try not on to get them. the season. Um, a lot longer in the summertime than in the wintertime. Um, and it just, it, it just is how the smell travels in the air, travels better in warm air than it does in cold air. Um, basically, probably about a week and a half to two weeks if it hasn't rained. Uh, it's potent and it, so it basically, it loses its potency distance wise, but as you get closer to the dead skunk, um, it still will be retained basically until, um, a higher level of decomposition is occurring. So if those sulfur, those thiols don't break down very easily. What kind of noise do skunks make? Because a few years ago, about three years ago, I was sure I had skunks making out under my bathroom because it smelled like skunk and I could hear little chattering noises on there and stirring around. Um, so they do, they do chatter, they do grunt and they do hiss. Um, if you were hearing really loud noises, it could have been a fox. Um, cause uh, foxes, seriously, they, they smell, they smell bad. They smell really, really skunky too. Um, but they, they don't like make super duper loud noises, but they are vocal in the sense it'll, it'll just sound like, like chattering is probably a really good way to, if there's chattering noises. Um, but it's not nothing super, super loud. There's no <laughs> screaming. There's no barking or anything like that. Yeah. Cause I heard like chattering noises, but it smelled skunky. And we do have skunks that come up into the yard occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could put it definitely, if it wasn't like super, super loud, like any yelling or screaming. It probably and I'm thinking what out. happens if they breed under my house and live under there? <laughs> <laughs> then you won't have a lot of insects to worry about, but you just have to be careful when you're going outside. That's why I love my uh, possum that lives under there. Cause it doesn't bother yes. anything. <laughs> nope. They don't. And they'll keep the skunks out too. They'll, they'll defend their little hidey hole. Uh, possums have to be extra careful because they don't have a lot of fur. Um, we're pretty much at their northern range um, because they have hardly any fur. They're really, really um, susceptible to frostbite. They have no fur on their feet. They have no fur on their ears. They have no fur on their tail. They have barely any fur on their face. So um, when they find their little hidey holes in the wintertime, they will defend them for sure. Yeah, well, because it seems like they don't have much fur either. It no. looks like it's like spiky and very sparse. Yes, it is very sparse. They are, they are an interesting creature. Uh, it's, 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 it's very crazy that they're able to survive this far north because they are not fit. Like they, they're, they're not dressed for the cold by any means. <laughs> okay, do we have any last minute questions for Lauren? Uh, I, I have a question about your boardwalk, Lauren. Yes. My wife and I uh, walked all the way out to the end of it uh, on the 13th, which was a Saturday, a little over a week ago. And it had been years since we walked it. What happened to the railings? So they only had railing on the first half. So the 
the, what we call the short loop only has the railing. Yep. We are actually getting, um, we're working on a grant to redo the boardwalk. Um, it is an endeavor. Um, it, we initially were quoted, it was like almost $13 million to redo the boardwalk. So uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. so it's gonna be redone in pieces. Uh -huh. um, we are probably gonna do the short half first and then the long mm -hmm. loop and then work on the connection between the two. But um, my hope is they're gonna update it where it can be wider. Right now, the big issue, especially with social distancing, you cannot pat, you are within like three, three and a half feet at most of a person. Um, so we're hoping we're going to be able to widen it um, as well as extend the railings. That's a big one. We actually do a lot of school groups and it can be really tough for those little kids to be walking. Oh, we've had, we've had multiple kids fall into the marsh. I have fallen myself into the marsh. So um, we're actually are going, that is one thing that we were um, talking about was extending the railings because right now it is only on that short loop. Well, it looked, it looked to us like you'd taken the out railing. Originally, um, I thought they had, they had in. kickboards down, but they never had full railings on the back half of the boardwalk. Well, it seemed like less than 10% of the uh, boardwalk had any railing at all. Yeah. And yeah. that was just on one side. Yep, it's so, just on one side and it's just on the short loop. Yes. Um, yeah. They had more benches out, which would, you might have seen the post, post from that. Um, we're having a big issue on the boardwalk with, so Lake Erie has been incredibly high this year. Um, and for years past, um, basically for three years, it's been super high. Last year, I think the peak was 51 inches above average, which is over four feet above average. And the marsh is permeable to the lake, which means when the lake, it's basically the overflow for the lake. So when the lake is high, it's in the marsh all the time. Um, I've been working um, up here in Ohio for uh, with DNR for over five years the entire time I've been there it has the marsh has never dried out which is not normal marshes should be dry in the summer and wet in the spring and fall and so we haven't had a dry out period we're starting to lose trees in big numbers right now mm -hmm. so we've had trees fall with windstorms onto our benches and part of the boardwalk so they're we've actually lost part of our boardwalk but we had to rebuild parts so that's that's part of the grant as well we have um essentially we're gonna have a lift station um to help pump extra water back over to the lake and we're making it we're basically making a non-permeable dike to keep the water from coming in so we can control the water level of the marsh we have um endangered species of orchids in there that are basically are getting flooded out as well so, and the lake is cyclical. Some years it's high, some years it's low. In particular, though, the, this lake, has, the lake has been very, very high for very long. So mm -hmm. we're working on it and we're hopefully, hopefully in a few years, we're going to have some more com completion, especially like on the boardwalk end of things and um, in terms of flooding end of things as well. We're, um, I think, three years now into our five-year uh, water project for controlling the water level in the lake. So we're hoping coming this year, we'll be able to really start pumping that water out and then the dike will be completed. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I, I have a question about your skunks. Yes. Do they have to be a certain age before they get their smell, their stinky smell? They are <laughs> born with it. <laughs> well, um, now, I, I had skunks uh, years, a couple years ago under my deck and the city caught the mother skunk, so there was little ones under there, and you could hear them. Well, then I had to get, because the city didn't take care of skunks, so I had to call somebody else to do that. And there was like six or seven under my deck, and I was afraid of the smell, and he said, don't worry, they're too little, they won't spray. And that is part of it though, so they have their smell, but when they're itty, itty bitty, especially like before they're really out foraging with mom, they actually cannot control that muscle to help them spray. Okay. So they have it, but they can't do anything about it until they're about okay. eight weeks old. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. he wasn't, he wasn't concerned about <laughs> that at all. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure at least he knows from experience though, is that young enough yeah. age that he was good. Yeah. Another question, 
if you hit a skunk with your car, how do you they get rid of that smell from their car when the road stinks like, you know? Oh, that's a tough one. So you can break it down with vinegar. Um, acids break it down, but you got to be careful that it's not strong enough acid that will mess, me mess with your paint. So um, spraying with a vinegar um, water solution would be something that you could try to do. Uh, power wow. washing would be would work really well. And also um, using, because um, it is oils, using like something that will break down. Dawn is a really good one to okay. break down to at least get it off of your car and you can spray it into the street. We're hopefully- So going through car out. wash won't do it. No. Uh, no, you'd have to wash, you'd have to take it a couple of times, depending okay. on how bad it was. But, um, okay. and also when you're done changing the air filters in your car for the AC and like the engine air filters, oh, okay. really help too, because it gets in that. So there's a lot, if you hit a skunk, there's a lot you have to do to get rid of that smell. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, cool. wow. Okay. It's effective defense mechanism. It works really well, but uh, it's potent. <laughs> well, they say Dawn does everything, so. Yes, it yeah. does. Dawn's a very, very useful product, especially dealing with things like this. <laughs> so, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Lauren, for providing this program for us. Absolutely. Um, Lauren will be back next month. And I am blanking right now on exactly what you're presenting on. Um, I want to say frogs. maybe we're doing warbler. Frog. Frog. Warblers, yes. oh, frog. warblers are May, flowers are April, frogs are March. Yes. <laughs> so Lauren will be talking about frogs next month. Thank you so much, Lauren. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. All right.